Awesome. Hey, well, thanks for the invite. Uh, appreciate uh, Pastor Josh and Pastor Tom and, and the ability to uh, be with you all this weekend. Uh, as Josh mentioned, I pastor uh, in the Seattle region. We planted a church called Pursuit about eight years ago in a barn uh, right in uh, the middle of our city. Um, the city of Snohomish is a small city. It's about 10,000 people, and it's primarily an agricultural community. And it's, uh, it's where the Lord led us to, to, to start. About three years ago, we purchased um, a J.C. Penney building in our city, which is about the largest commercial building we have. And uh, we remodeled it, and today we do church there. We do about five services on Sunday morning, and then we do one service Sunday night in Seattle. And so, uh, as Josh mentioned, we've kind of been in a little bit of a growth pattern since uh, COVID, and uh, it's just been exceptional to see all the great things that God has done by His own Spirit uh, in and through uh, our community. And, and I, re I really sense that it's that what is happening uh, in Snohomish is actually just a microcosm of what God is doing much more broadly across the nation. And uh, even though uh, COVID was a hard season for so many, um, for whatever reason, I believe that what the enemy intends for evil, God uses for good. And God is actually using this COVID season in one sense to hit reset on the church. And number two, to allow us to come back even stronger than we were before. And so I really sense that this can be a season of supernatural growth and advancement for this body of believers. And in doing so, we're just going to add our faith together and believe for even better days ahead for what God would desire to do both in and through this uh, community. Now, we planted the church uh, eight years ago in a barn, uh, as I mentioned, and it wasn't like uh, a fancy, cool, you know, wedding barn. It was like a barn barn, and uh, it had no indoor plumbing. It had no heat. Uh, the electricity we ran on extension cords to a neighboring house. And uh, that's where we started. And so we met there uh, for a number of months until God provided a location that we could rent for, for a few months. And then we bought a building and outgrew that and ended up buying another building. And so we've just been on this journey uh, with the Lord ever since and have just been so thankful uh, for all of the great things that uh, He has done. The, the, the tagline that we use in, in, in our community is that uh, we aren't impressed with us, but we're really impressed with Him. And um, the more that you grow in the faith, the more you realize how much you are on the receiving end of undeserved kindness from God. And um, like David said, he said, we will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And so uh, I, I really have a high ecclesiology. I really believe in the local church. I believe that the local church is the hope of the world and that this church can function as a light set on a hill for all men to see. And the world needs the church more than it has ever needed it before. And I think one of the things that uh, we found out during all of the COVID lockdowns and shutdowns and all those types of things was how quickly the world descends into chaos when the church isn't allowed to gather. And so I am more a believer in the local church today than I've ever been before. And I'm just uh, confident that by virtue of you being here this evening, uh, that you are a part of the greatest organization that God has ever built. And in fact, it's the one organization that God says the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And there's a lot of good things that Christians and nonprofit ministries and parachurch organizations do, but there is only one local church. And uh, you are, are, are a part of a, a great force here uh, in Southern California, and it's not a defensive force. Because when Scripture says the gates of hell cannot prevail against it, it presupposes that the church is a threat to the enemy's kingdom. So we are constantly advancing by force, and in doing so, the gates of hell cannot prevail against this advancement. Scripture says it this way, The kingdoms of this world are the kingdoms of our God and of our King, and to the increase of His government and His peace there is no end. And so right now we live during a great time of kingdom transition. The kingdoms of this world are becoming, it's an ongoing process, they are becoming the kingdoms of our God and of our King. And together, you and I, we get to reap the reward of the one who has gone before us and made a way where there seems to be no way. And I'm just confident that God foresaw every mistake you would ever make, and He still put His calling and His gifting on your life. And the Apostle Paul said, it is irrevocable and it is without repentance. And the great news about the God that we serve is that you're not strong enough to screw this up. 
It doesn't mean that you can't screw it up. And, you know, if you follow Jesus for any number of years, undoubtedly you've screwed up a time or two. But the calling and the election of God is sure. It's solid. It, it, it does not vacillate on an emotional spectrum. God has never had to apologize to you for having an out-of-character moment. Um, the God that we serve is the same yesterday, today, and, and forever. And, and He's put His favor on your life, and He's put His favor on this church to be a force for good in Orange County and beyond. And so just excited to partner with you and uh, just believing in God's best uh, really for this community and uh, I'm grateful for the leaders that you have and the leaders that we have represented here uh, in this room. Hey, tonight, I, I wanted to share uh, real briefly on some organizational principles that we actually find in Scripture. And I believe that they can become tools of use for you, even starting tonight and moving forward. Um, I've got some really good news, and it's also bad news at the same time, and it's this. The health of the people in this room will be the health of the church tomorrow. So that is both good news and potentially bad news <laughs> all at the same time. And so I think sometimes, you know, pastors and leaders ask the question, but how can we just get our church healthy? And how can we get our church growing? And how could we move forward in these following areas? And how could we really see an explosion of the prophetic or fill in the blank, whatever it is? And the reality is, is that the giftings in this room, the callings in this room, the anointings in this room, the stewardship of this room, the spiritual health of this room, the emotional health of this room, the mental health of this room is the health of the church tomorrow. And even we see this principle in Scripture when there's anointing, it, it starts on the head and it comes down on the shoulders and it, and it drips down the, the cloak and, and then it, it, it finally connects, it co collects at the hem. And so both spiritually speaking and organizationally speaking, it comes from the leader or the leadership on down. And one of the best investments that you could ever make in your church is the investment in your team. One of the best ways that you honor the people that you serve is by being a continually developing person. And one of the greatest tragedies of Christian life is when people feel like they've graduated out of their own need to develop. Like, I've been there, I've done that, I bought the t-shirt, I've put in the years... I've got the battle scars to prove it, and I'm good. But even Paul, when he talks about salvation, and then more broadly, when he, when he helps frame in our theology on sanctification, he says, we are saved, and we are being saved. And it presupposes to us today that there is this lifelong developmental pattern that you and I are in, and that the day that you give up on your development is actually the day that you begin to die. And so regardless of how long you've been in church or how long you've been in this church, how long you've been born again, how many areas or departments you've served in, you know, we could all compare resumes tonight and, and, and you know, talk about who knows what. But the reality is, is that what is universally true about everyone in this room is we have room to grow, myself included. We've got more to learn. <clears throat> We've got more to digest. We've got parts of our mind that continue to need to be renewed. We've got parts of our hearts that continue to need to be developed. We've got part of our emotional maturity that continues to need to be deepened. I'm struck by what James says in James, James 1. He says, consider it joy when you face trials and tribulations of various kind. And then he, he says this statement in verse 1 that I think is so intriguing. He says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature, that you may be complete, and that you may be lacking nothing, but let perseverance finish its work. And I'm of the belief that perseverance doesn't finish its work until God calls you home. <clears throat> we're regenerated. We're in the process of being sanctified. One day we will be glorified and we'll see, see Him face to face. But until the day that Jesus calls me home, it's my conviction that every day I've got room to grow. I've got more to develop. I've got another skill to learn. I've got another area of my heart that continues to need to be discipled and developed. And so I think that's what this is about tonight. And this is one of the great privileges I have as I share with different churches across the nation. I love to be able to get leaders in a room and just speak to them because the reality is, is that the rest of the church, it hinges on the weight that is carried by the folks that are represented here tonight. And so I commend you for your involvement in the local church, for serving, for laying down your life to be a part of what God is building here. It is not insignificant. It is not common. It is sacred. It is significant. It's weighty. It's important. And the enemy will work overtime in your mind to try to get you the, to doubt the significance of your investment or your involvement. 
you've got to know tonight that whether you're helping direct traffic in the parking lot, whether you're holding babies in the nursery, whether you're singing on the worship team or preaching behind the pulpit, every person in here is instrumental in the building of God's house. The Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter, they use the imagery of rocks to describe the church of the living God. They say we are living stones that are being built together. And that's what you and I are tonight. We are living stones in the house of God. And I don't know if you've ever had the privilege of seeing something get built, but it's not always clean. It's not always nice. It's most of the time messy. It involves a lot of loud noises, sparks flying everywhere. Carpenters hitting their thumb with the hammer, saying words they shouldn't. I mean, that, that's what it looks like to build. And here's what I found. People love the theory of building church more than they love the practice of building church. Right? It's just like people love the theory of being married more than the practice of being married. <laughs> people love the theory of having children more than the practice of raising children. And so we live in this culture that really idealizes the theory, but doesn't so much love the production of. And, and because you're in this room, you know what it's like to grind. You know what happens behind the scenes. You know the amount of work. You know, so many people, they just come in Sunday morning and they think that church just happens. You know, it's like before I moved out of, uh, you know, my, my, uh, my parents' house when I got married, you know, I, I just kind of thought food appeared in the fridge. You know, it was just kind of, I'd never lived on my own before. And then I got married, we bought a house, and I'm like, well, where's the food? Well, you got to go buy it. You got to go, you know, a lot of the folks who gather on Sunday morning, they have no idea how many man hours it takes. They have no idea how hard you've worked to build serve teams, calling people late on Saturday night because somebody declined a planning center request. I mean, this is the nature of what it looks like to build and grow churches. But what I've learned is to fall in love with the process <clears throat> because God has given you a sacred trust. He has entrusted you with the building of something eternal. And, uh, and it's worth it when folks get baptized and born again. You see them encounter God in worship. You just... You think back on all the hard work that it's taken to get there, and you just say, wow, it's worth it. It's still worth it to follow Jesus. It's still worth it to be a builder in the house of God. And so I commend you for that, and I think um, being involved in church is, is, uh, as a builder is, is one of the most life-transformative things uh, that you can ever um, be a part of. Real, brief, real briefly, I'm going to hit four attitudes uh, that um, – People oftentimes have in, in church world, and I think it's important just to be aware of them. And then I'm going to hit four responsibilities. I'm going to talk four attitudes and then four responsibilities that we have as believers. And I'm reminded of the great qu quote from um, <coughs> President John F. Kennedy where he said, Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for it. And I'm going to give you some, some um, high-level uh, 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 thoughts tonight. And... And with the underlying sentiment, ask not what the church can do for you, but, but what you can do for it. And taking that personal responsibility that you have as a believer to continue to steward the richness of what God has placed in you, the treasure that is in earthen vessels, you and I are earthen vessels, the treasure that God has placed inside of us, and then the responsibility that we have to continue to manage that, uh, that treasure. Um, the four attitudes that I'm going to talk about just real briefly are dependent, independent, codependent, and interdependent. And I'm, I'm going to give you some brief descriptions. And as I'm giving you these descriptions, there's going to be people that come to your mind. Uh, and don't, don't shout them out because they might be in this room. But if you've been in church world well long enough, you're, you're just going to recognize everybody comes to church with a different expectation especially in the West because we have been so saturated by consumerism culture, okay? So oftentimes people treat church like fast food drive through you know? This is the number I want. This is what I want on it. This is what I don't want on it. And if it's not good, I want to talk to the manager, in this case, the senior pastor. <laughs> and uh, you know, just being in church world, church world attracts all sorts of people from all different walks of life. You got folks who've been faithfully following Jesus 60, 70 years, and they're heading off into the retirement years, and they found a church in Orange County, and they just love to be a part of it. You got folks who are just fresh out of the world. They don't know left from right. They don't know Genesis to Revelation. They don't, and they're just fresh. And we're, we put them all in the same room and mix them up on a Sunday morning. And of course, what does that create? It creates conflict. 
It creates gaps in expectation. It creates a lot of sparks, but that's where the real transformation of, of the gospel happens in people's lives. It happens in the mess of church. <clears throat> church is messy by design. You know, I tell people, I say, if you find a perfect church, don't go there because you'll ruin it. <laughs> church is messy by design. And, and as, as a pastor, as a leader, as a voice in, in, in this local house, you, 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 you are a part of helping curate the mess of people's lives and make sense out of their brokenness, make sense out of their broken pieces and their disconnected timelines. And, but you'll notice some of these, these attitudes that people have. And the first is, the first is dependent. Dependent says it's everyone else's responsibility to take care of me. This is what we call the needy Nellies. Constantly in need, just constantly. Uh, they've never learned to live life outside of the context of going from crisis to crisis. They don't go from glory to glory, that's for sure. It's crisis to crisis. It don't matter how much you give. Sometimes it feels like they're a black hole. Super dependent. Don't matter what age they are, they are spiritually adolescent, constantly in need, becoming a great drain on the emotional resources that you have. But the second is equally dangerous. It's independent. I know especially in our country, we love you know, independence. We'll celebrate our independence. But independence says, I'm better off alone. The folks who come to the church, or maybe they show up once every four weeks or five weeks or two months, when they, whenever they feel like it, whenever the pastor is preaching on whatever subject that they want, but they just refuse to plug in or engage in the community. They have become, like Merton said, an island unto themselves. They are the sovereign source of all authority in their own life. I am really, I am really the God that, that I worship. I am independent. And you should be so blessed that I would show up to your church on a Sunday. <laughs> Oftentimes I refer to these folks as the busy bees. They like pollinating all of the flowers. They like pollinating all of the churches, but they can't commit to one. But because they're so independent, they'll stay at a church as long as the pastor doesn't preach on their sin. <laughs> as long as they're not offended as long as everything kind of works well for exactly what they like. And so you have dependent, and then you have folks who are just so independent, they forget that church and Christianity is, it is a communal mission. We are doing this thing together. We are better together. In fact, in the created order, after every day, the Father says, it is good until He creates man. And then He says, it is not good, what? For man to be alone. We got a lot of independent, I call them homeless Christians. They don't got a home because they're so independent. Okay. Number three is this codependent. Okay. Codependent says this I primarily belong to dysfunctional, one sided relationships where one person relies on the other for meeting nearly all of their emotional and self esteem needs. I'm not okay if you're not okay, and you're not okay if they're not okay, and we're all just trying to figure out if we can be okay by adjudicating if somebody else is okay. <laughs> Codependent. My entire emotional life and sense of balance and semblance is, is completely dependent on circumstances that I cannot control. People get in codependent relationships because of toxic family systems. People get in codependent relationships because of trauma. People get in codependent relationships because of delayed maturation. I mean, you name it. You've got the ditch of dependency, the ditch of independency, and then the ditch of codependency. These are all the different types of folks that you'll minister to. And, and the reality is, is even as I'm giving you this list, these are not just the folks that we minister to. These are the temptations we have in our own heart. All of us. It's easy to teach or share from the perspective of, well, I figured it all out, and so, you know, let me share with you from the mountaintop all of the life lessons I've learned. But the reality is, is that for all of us, these are all things that we continue to walk through and develop in our own hearts, where you recognize maybe in your own life there are, there are some things that I'm dependent on that I shouldn't. There are other areas where I reject community, where I've got an independent streak and it's not healthy. I've got other parts of my heart that are codependent, not okay if somebody else isn't okay, and I find myself on the emotional roller coaster. 
And the fourth is where we want to move people. And where we want to move people is interdependent. Now, interdependent says, I have a part to play. We are better together. I enjoy being part of a team and part of a family. But ultimately, my outcomes and emotional health aren't tied to another person because they have already been settled by Christ. And so not just in this room, but in the folks that we minister to on a week-in and week-out basis, we're helping them move from dependency or independency or codependency into interdependency. No, God created you for community. And in fact, there is something on my life that you need. There's probably something on your life that I need. There's certainly a gift that you're going to bring in the context of corporate worship and service and fellowship that is going to be instrumental in the life of somebody else. You have a part to play. You're not just here to receive because it's more blessed to give anyways. There is something not just for you to get on Sunday morning. There's something for you to bring. We are all part of this expression together. And when you move people to spiritual interdependency, it should function as kind of a signpost in your own framework, in your own mindset, that this person is taking the necessary developmental steps out of immaturity and into maturity. Remember, discipleship is not a box that we check off. Discipleship is not like a badge you get after completing a week at VBS. Discipleship is not a degree that you get. And I believe in getting degrees and all sorts of things. But Discipleship is this lifelong process of moving people closer and closer to the heart of God and in doing so, see every area of their life, number one, submitted to His Lordship, and then number two, transformed by His Spirit. And so if you got everything you needed at the moment of salvation and there was nothing else for you to give, the Lord would have just called you home on that day. You would have said the sinner's prayer at the altar. The very next moment you would have been struck dead and you would have been in glory. But the reason why you're still here is because not only do you have more to grow in, but you've got more to give, you've got more to pour out, you've got another life to reach, you've got another young person to impact, you've got another baby to hold in the nursery. There's more for your life, and that's why you're here. And in fact, the greatest argument against death is an unfinished assignment. And people got to operate with supernatural spiritual purpose in this season, lest you become distracted or distraught by the spirit of the age. And our culture has worked overtime to try to convince our, our, our neighborhoods, our communities, our cities that the church is dead and that really it's no longer needed in the first place. And the reality is, is the church has never been more needed than it is now. And this is a great time for supernatural advancement for courageous churches, spirit-filled communities, and people who live with a sense of purpose uh, as it pertains to the mission that God has given them. So we are not just here to pay the electrical bill. And we know the electrical bill needs to get paid. We are not just here to host another meeting, and, and we love to host meetings. The church exists to glorify Jesus, and in doing so, bring people into an encounter with His presence. And the Bible says, in His presence there is fullness. Which means that if you get the presence, you get everything else. But if you don't get the presence, it doesn't matter what else you get because it doesn't matter. So you are priests unto God. In the Old Testament, it was just the Levites. But the Apostle Peter says in the New Testament, you are priests unto God. And so we are here as priests unto the one who is ultimately holy And in doing so, we are charged with creating an environment that honors Him and that in it has the capacity to see people's lives transformed for all of eternity. So these are some of the things that we talk through as it pertains to how do we know if we're winning? How do we know if we're moving the ball forward? You know, just about every other secular environment, there are really clear metrics for whether or not we're winning. If you were to watch the Thursday night football game tonight, it's the team that has more points at the end of the game. They're the winner. (laughs) Sometimes in church world, we don't really know how to define the win. So we can get into it five, ten years and ask ourselves the question, are we winning? Like, if the church grows, does that mean we're winning? If the money increases, does that mean we're winning? If more people are getting saved, does that mean we're winning? Are we growing wide? Are we growing deep? Are we growing at all? One of the best metrics for measurement, I think, 
pertains to the spiritual health of the people we minister to through our weekend experiences. And for you as a leader, as a pastor, as a servant here in this house, you have a front row seat to the messy development of people's lives. And ultimately, at the end of the day, you become the best person to answer that question, are we winning? Hey, this person's been here two years, three years, 30 years. Are we moving in the right direction? Are they healthier in 2022 than they were in 2021? Are they growing in their interdependency? Or am I still the messianic figure that they always have to call when their life goes off the rails every other Thursday? Are we moving folks to a place where we're interdependent because we understand we have a mutual responsibility, but ultimately we're submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and we're developing in an upward trajectory? And so for you and, and, and for me, these are some of the tough questions that, that we not only ask others, but we ask ourselves as we help people move along the kind of linear line of, 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 of you know, Christological development. You might not be where you want to be today, but could you thank God that you aren't where you used to be? Are we moving in the right direction? Are we causing people to have a greater reliance on Christ than they ever have before? I want to transition just a little bit and, and just share with you kind of the four, um, what I call responsibilities that you have as a servant in the house of God as it pertains to stewarding the treasure that God has uh, deposited uh, inside of you. I think in Scripture and oftentimes in preaching, there is a big emphasis on what God can do for you. There's a big emphasis on what a church can do for you. There's a big emphasis on what a leader or a pastor can do for you. But oftentimes there's very little emphasis on the individual responsibility that we have as believers. I think one of the greatest crises that we have in the West today is the crisis of irresponsibility. Nobody's responsible for what they do anymore. It don't matter what crime you commit, don't matter how crazy you act. It's always because 14 generations ago somebody did something to your family. Nobody can take responsibility. It's always somebody else's fault. It's because you grew up poor. It's because your public school was underfunded. It's because you lived on the wrong side of the tracks. It's because you didn't have the same equitable opportunities as the person next to you. In our world, and especially in the West, we have a really hard time assigning blame to the individual because you know, there, is, there is an entire culture that has been built around the avoidance of responsibility. You know, our, our government and our leaders, we can't, even, we can't even really call things right or wrong anymore because that would require a value judgment. And we have moved into a post-truth society because when we all have individual claims to truth, what it actually means is nothing is true. Because I can say two plus two is four, but if you say two plus two is five, and my response is, well, that's your truth, and here's the reality. We don't have our own truths. We have opinions, but we don't have our own truths. <clears throat> there is one who not only has truth, but is truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by Him. So oftentimes our culture, I think, views Jesus as kind of this wise philosopher who dispenses truth. But a Christian understanding of Jesus is Jesus is not just the one who dispenses truth. He's the one who defines truth. He embodies it. It is the core essence of his personhood, which means for us as believers, Christ becomes the lens by which we view everything around us. But because we're in this post-truth generation, we're also in a post-responsibility generation. Nobody is responsible for anything. And so this will seem like a bit of a countercultural message, but I think it's not only true for you, but it's, it's true for the folks that we minister to. And one of the great developmental tools that I've used over the years as a pastor is by encouraging people to take responsibility for their spiritual journey. And sometimes you'll see people, they'll backslide, they'll leave church, life gets all messed up, they'll come back and they'll say things like, well, if only the pastor would have called me more. If only my youth leader would have shown up to my basketball games more. If only, if only, if only... If only that deacon would have got me involved in the serve team more. If only somebody would have known. And what I found is that a lot of people operate as if we're just these all-knowing, all-seeing psychics who know every crisis moment of the, well, you should have known I was having a tough time. It's like, I don't even know if I'm having a tough time. Like, I, 
how, how am I supposed to know if you're having a tough time? So a lot of people, they projected their responsibility for spiritual growth onto somebody else. And I'm a pastor. Obviously, I believe in pastors. We need strong pastors. And pastors are the great under shepherds. Christ is the chief shepherd. And so we definitely have a responsibility to help people grow. But I want you to begin to see your responsibility more as creating a greenhouse that gives people the best chance at having a successful spiritual life. Because at the end of the day, the old adage is as true today as it's ever been. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And there is nothing more frustrating in life than wanting something for someone more than they want it themselves. And so one of the great developmental tools that I've used over the years is flipped around the question, especially as the church begins to grow. You know, there was a time where the entire church could have fit in our living room, and they did on a regular basis. And there was a time where everybody had the pastor's cell phone number, and there was a time when the church <clears throat> operated more as kind of like an overgrown family unit, and we were all kind of just connected because we were that size. But as the church began to grow, the reality is, is that the people I pastor now are really about 35. I pastor about 35 people at our church that are staff. And the staff pastor 3,000, but I, I pastor 35. And what I've found is that as the church continues to grow, one of the things you have to continue to do is manage other people's expectations. They come in and they go, well, the last church I was at, and I go, well, the last church you were at had 18 people. <laughs> so, of course, the pastor was at your beck and call anytime you wanted because you were one of 18. But you're coming into this environment. We're hiring people I don't even know. The reality is, is that the org has outgrown our ability to individually babysit the spiritual needs of people. And that sounds callous at first, but the reason why I'm sharing that with you is because oftentimes in leadership, we unintentionally develop messianic complexes, and we begin to think that we are the answer to people's problems. And if we were to be honest tonight, one of the reasons why we do that is because it feels good for our ego to be needed. So it means your patterns, your thinking, your motives, your money, your habits, your attitudes, your proclivities, your prejudices, your family, your calendar. Present every part of who you are, mind, body, and spirit. Present it as a living sacrifice unto God. Paul says it's reasonable. Costly and sacrificial transformation is the only reasonable response to a God who has so extravagantly loved us. Watch. It's not worship until it's sacrificial. Meaning this. It's not worship until it costs you something. Your Christianity hasn't cost you anything until it's assaulted your comfort. The Spirit of God has come to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. And in our world today, we probably need more of the disturbing of the comfortable than we've ever had before. And so Paul is outlining for the church in Rome what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. These are just a bunch of first century pagans and confused Jews. And they're in the middle of this Roman government, which is this antichrist system. Christians are being persecuted. The whole world's upside down. The Roman government is teetering on collapse. And Paul is writing these Christian refugees, essentially, who are these odd people, the odd ones out. And he's saying, let me help outline for you what it looks like to actually follow Jesus. It means that you present yourself as, as, a, as a living sacrifice. A sacrifice is not entitled to its own opinion. And it's hard to kill what's already dead. So Paul is using this Old Testament language, but he's using it to describe a New Testament reality. He's saying, hey, in the same way that the Jewish brethren had a ceremonial custom of sacrificing animals for the atoning of sin, consider yourself not to be a dead sacrifice, but to be a living sacrifice, but one who is completely submitted to the altar of God's development, and by doing so has God's fire consume them for the purpose of holy and righteous living. This is going to cost you everything. And they go, what do you mean by everything? I mean everything, everything. And they go, like, what do you mean? Like our family? I go, way more than your family. This is going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you your sexual preferences. It's going to cost you your temptations. 
It's going to cost you your time, your attention, your resources. It's going to cost you everything. They started crying in the office. And I said, look, I'm not trying to scare you. I have grace, mercy. I'm not mad at people who sin differently than me. I said, hey, this is a place for you. We love you. We'll take you. You know, it's our job to catch the fish. It's God's job to clean the fish. We'll, we'll take you any way that you come. But I said, here's the reality. If you're asking me, what is this going to cost to be a Christian? Let me just be up front. It, you are going to be a living sacrifice unto God. And that means when his fire comes on you, it'll consume everything that is not of him. Now, God is so good that he doesn't try to correct everything in our lives all at once. Why? Because if that would have happened on the day that you would have got saved, you would have had a panic attack and a heart attack at the same time. You would have been overcome with your own depravity. But God is so loving. Watch what the Bible says. It's the kindness and goodness of God that leads men to repentance. So God calls us unto himself by his spirit. We make a good confession of faith. We're born again into God's family. And then sanctification is the process by which you walk out what you've already legally been declared to be. See, when you got saved, God declared you to be righteous, but you weren't actually righteous. You were legally righteous, but you weren't actually righteous. Sanctification is the process by which you become what Christ has legally declared you to be. And sanctification hurts. And one of the great ways that we can continue to develop systems of development in our churches is by helping people understand that there is a great cost as it pertains to following Jesus. One of the things that I'm most struck by is when the crowds gather to hear Jesus. He's teaching, signs, wonders, miracles are happening. Great crowds gather. He feeds them all. And, uh, you know, there's thousands that have gathered. And at the height of Jesus' ministry, he turns to the crowds. And he says, oh, and by the way, if you want to follow me, eat my flesh, drink my blood. No explanation. And I'm like, this is the worst church growth strategy ever. <laughs> well, come on, Jesus. Take an offering. Do something. What do you, you know? And the Bible says the crowds desert him. He turns to his disciples and he says, will you leave also? And I love their response. Only you have the words of life. Where else will we go? And we need to inform people that there is actually a great cost to following Jesus. Why? Because costless Christianity produces powerless Christianity. And Jesus, even when he talks about discipleship, he uses this phrase, count the cost. There's a high cost coming to Jesus. It requires your all because you give up the right to self-identify. You give up the right to say, well, I was born this way. It's just who I am. You give up the right to say, well, this is just my family. It's who I am. You give up the right to blame everything on your culture. You give up that right. Why? Because your life is no longer your own. You've been bought with a price. So the first responsibility that we have as leaders, and one of the primary things that we walk people through in a developmental sense, is this idea that you must present yourself. Hey, I'm going to come to Christ. I'm going to be transparent because God can't fix what you fake. I'm going to be transparent about where I'm at. I'm going to be transparent about my shortcomings. I know not everything is going to change overnight. But God, if you'll take me, here I am, and I'm not going to get up off the altar. I'm a living sacrifice, reasonable service, which is acceptable unto him. That's the first. You've got to present yourself. Number two is this. Encourage yourself. Encourage yourself. Now watch what happens here. 1 Samuel 30 and verse 6. David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the souls of all the people were grieved. Every man for his sons and for his daughters, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. David encouraged himself. Which tells me this, encouragement is an inside job, not an outside job. Which means your level of courage, your level of encouragement, has very little to do with anybody else's response to you and a lot to do with your interior responses to the things happening around you. You cannot control what happens to you. You can't. The only thing you can control in this room is your response to what happens to you. I mean, that's just the reality of life, and life is unfair from the very beginning. You know what's also unfair? The kingdom of God. 
One of the most striking parables that Jesus ever tells is uh, the man who is paying out wages to his workers. One starts at 6 a.m., the other starts at 9 a.m., one starts at 12 p.m., one starts at 3 p.m. And at the end of the day, he decides that he's going to pay each of them the same. One of the workers raises his hand to complain, well, he didn't work as long as I did, and this isn't fair. And the response of the kingdom is, what is it to you what the king decides to do with the king's resources? And so I think sometimes in our world and in, in our life, you know, I, I try to tell people this all the time. You don't, you know, sometimes people in Christianity they say, well, I just want what I deserve. No, you don't. <laughs> I promise you, you don't. <laughs> Why? Because you deserve hell and judgment. And what you have gotten is grace and mercy. So we don't want what we deserve. And so however God decides to hand out resources, that's His business, not mine. Why? Because we're in sales. We're not in management. The goal of the church, Spurgeon said, is to make the invisible kingdom visible. Now what God does with that, that's His responsibility, not mine. So my job is to be the world's greatest salesman or communicator or advocate of the invisible kingdom being made visible through the actions of the church and individual believers. But I love this. David is in the midst of leading the men on a military campaign. The Amalekites sneak in, raid their houses, and kidnap their families. David comes back from a mission, finds his entire city destroyed, the people are so upset, they want to kill David. So if you think you've had a, a bad day in church, just, just go ahead and take some encouragement from the stories of Scripture. You know, we use this word like persecution. You know, every time something unfortunate happens to us. And the reality is, is that our barometer for what counts as persecution is very low compared to the world around us. But I, I just love what it says of David. David encouraged himself, which means this, when you find yourself low on courage, when you find yourself low on esteem, when you find yourself low on confidence, it's not that God can't supernaturally use somebody else to help stir that inside of you, but what it means is that it's not somebody else's responsibility to manage your encouragement level, it's yours. So when somebody else comes around and encourages me, I want it to function as confirmation, not information. Hey, let me confirm, man, there's something great inside of you. Man, I just really want you to know how awesome it is to have you on this team. I just want to let you know you're doing a great job. I know you don't always feel like it, but just keep going. I want encouragement to function as confirmation of what God has already put on my radar, not information that's out of the blue. By the way, that's my same metric for prophecy. I think prophecy should function as confirmation. Hey, when you get a prophetic word, it should confirm a sense that you already have in your heart. Hey, God, thank you for confirming that. I felt like the leading of the Holy Spirit, but I wasn't sure, and now you've used somebody to confirm that. But I think so often, even without realizing it, we make it other people's responsibility to manage our own emotional IQ. And the reality is, is that not only do we not have the ability to do that for others, but your pastors don't have the ability to do that for you. You know, church is a great place where we have learned how to lie about how we're really doing. <laughs> how you doing? Great. No, you're not. How are you feeling? Great. No, you're not. How's the family? Good. No, it's not. <laughs> but I get it. We have all these short interactions in church and halfway conversations in the foyer and all sorts of things. But, you know, you have it within yourself to draw on the deep well of God's spirit that's been deposited inside of you. Jesus says this in John 7. On the last day of the great feast, he stands up and he declares with a loud voice, those who believe will receive. And out of their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And these things Jesus spoke concerning the Holy Spirit who had not yet been given. Now, of course, we live in the dispensation where His Spirit has been given, which means this. You have a river flowing inside of you, which means this. You have the capacity to encourage yourself. And what you'll find is that when you're overflowing with courage, you become a natural encourager of people around you. You don't even have to say things to them. They just get in your overflow and they leave encouraged. Each of you have people in your life who function like this. You just feel better when you hang out with them for no other reason than you've been with them. 
you don't have to talk about anything. You don't have to talk about church. They don't have to ask 10 questions. You can go out and tell jokes, watch a football game. It doesn't matter. By the time you leave, you're like, man, that felt so good. What happened? You received out of their overflow. Why? Because spirit communicates to spirit. You're receiving out of their overflow. And you want to be that type of person. And, and I know that I've given into this temptation myself, especially in the early days of church planting. And, you know, um, when I started out in ministry, I had a mentor tell me, they said, ministry is a walk in the park. Uh, but what I found out is it's Jurassic Park, you know? <laughs> that's, the, that's the park you're in. It's, it's a walk, and you're in Jurassic Park. And that's the reality. And so I can't tell you how many times I've had to go in my room, lock myself in, and pray in the Holy Ghost until I sense a spirit of courage come on me to face whatever that day's crisis is. And I think probably early on in my ministry career, I probably unintentionally, not out of bad motives, but just out of immaturity, made it everybody else's responsibility to encourage me. Well, you know, it's my wife's fault because she, you know, didn't tell me that I preached good on Sunday or it's the board's fault or it's this person's fault or it's, if they just really knew what was going on inside of me. It's like, well, I didn't even really know what was going on inside of me. You're just, you're just fighting the good fight. You're just standing and after you've done everything to stand, you're continuing to stand. You're just, you're just, you know how you win by not giving up. That's how you win. And so I'm just trying to do the best that I can. And I still remember the day I came across 1 Samuel and it was like, you know how you can read the Bible a thousand times? And then on the thousand and first time, it's like you're seeing something that you swear was never in there before. <laughs> that was like it for me when I read 1 Samuel 30 and 6. I went, my God, I got to stop. Wow, I just unlocked the key. And if you don't learn the art of encouraging yourself, you know, the Christian life has a very unique topography. You got mountains on one day, valleys on the next times where you just feel like this is the greatest thing ever. I am a spiritual hero. Everybody loves me. They're all shouting in the streets, laying down their coats, waving their palm branches. <laughs> and then three days later, give us Barabbas. <laughs> Crucify him. And you're like, what happened? And it used to make me feel crazy as a Christian, especially as a pastor, as a leader. I'm like, am I losing it? Am I, is my, am I losing my mind? What's happening here? I learned the secret of encouraging myself. And each of you in this room, you have different ways that your tank gets filled back up. You know, you guys are here in beautiful Southern California. I told Pastor Josh, I said, I don't even need um, a special conference to speak at. I'll come down any time just to be in Southern California. <laughs> you know, in the Northwest, we have nine months of gray and rain. And, uh, but everybody in this room, there's different ways that you engage and encounter God. And there's different ways that your spirit are rejuvenated. Some of you, you're more introverted. And in order for you to recharge, you need to get alone. Turn the cell phone off. You're not talking to anybody. You're not looking at anybody. You're not thinking about anybody. It's you alone. For others of you, that drive you crazy. Absolutely bonkers. You, you're an extrovert. You're recharged by being around the right people. Others of you, it's like when I get out in nature and I just see the ocean and the sunset, when I'm out there on the beach with the Lord, I just really, however it is, each of us have different ways that we're recharged, but you really got to learn to know yourself intuitively because the Lord has placed those different secrets that are within that really function as signposts that let you know when your courage tank is low and it needs to be refilled. Now watch, David encouraged himself not because the circumstances were pleasant, not because his relational dynamics were pleasant, not because he had some brilliant plan on how to turn this all around, but because even on his bad days, he had a God who walked with him through every season of life. Hear me, no defeat is permanent for those who trust in the Lord. It can't always be everyone else's responsibility to manage and develop the emotional intelligence of my life. See, this wasn't the only time David would employ this tactic. Remember when David committed his great sin with Bathsheba and their first son died as a result of judgment? The Bible says David washed his face and he went to the house of God to worship. And David's contending for the life of his son. And the Lord will not have it. His son dies and it's the result of David's sin. And the Bible says something interesting. David washed his face. It says something else interesting. 
he anoints himself and he goes to the house of God to worship. And I just thought, man, what a powerful reminder from Scripture on the individual responsibility that you and I have in this room to be those who will find ourselves sometimes in the valley of the shadow of death, but we know that we have a God who walks with us, and if He was faithful on the mountain, He'll also be faithful in the valley. And why can't you just have mountaintop experiences for the rest of your life? Well, number one, because God has a sense of humor. But number two, because when you walk through the valleys, God proves, I am faithful at every elevation of your life. And watch, there are some things that are only developed in the valley seasons of life. There are some things in your life that will never go developed until you find the ability to worship in the valley. Everything is falling apart. My life is a mess. I've got no other options outside of encouraging myself in the Lord. Number three is this. Stir yourself. Stir yourself. 2 Timothy 1. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. As night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded it now lives in you. Therefore, I remind you, stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, for those of you who understand your New Testament epistles, you'll know that 2 Timothy is the last letter Paul ever writes. Because shortly after this letter is written, he is executed by Nero. His head is cut off. And Timothy is pastoring in the city of Ephesus. Some church historians believe the church was 30,000 in Ephesus. Timothy later will also suffer a martyr's death as well. But Paul is writing who he calls his true son in the faith, uh, Timothy. And he says, I long to see you. Something lives inside of you because I saw it in Lois and I saw it in Eunice and I'm convinced it lives in you, but I'm not there. I'm in a Roman prison and I don't know if I'll ever get out of here. So Timothy, stir up the gift of God that is inside you that is there by virtue of me laying my hands on your life. Stir yourself up. In Paul's final letter, he instructs Timothy in this fashion, knowing that his time is short. He tells Timothy, I'm convinced something of value lives in you. Now let me remind you to stir it up. I want you to see something. Paul says it was generational. He says it was in Lois, it was in Eunice, and now it's in you. It was generational, but hear me, generational wasn't enough. It was imparted, Paul tells Timothy, it's in you because I laid my hands on you, but impartation wasn't enough. It didn't become sustainable until Timothy took an ownership for what he received and stirred it up until the flame became a fire. See, it starts when you get prayer at the altar, but it develops as you learn the discipline of stirring yourself up. Here's the reality. Here's my prayer for you tonight. I never want this church to be bigger than the church that is in your heart. So then how do we grow the church? Stir yourself up. The biggest danger that we have in church leadership today is pastors leading outwardly big churches with inner tiny churches. See, there's a tabernacle in your heart that must be tended to. Your own relationship with the Lord. Your own stewardship of the things He's placed in your life. Your own development of those deep things that He stirred inside of you, placed inside of you. Those own experiences you've had. You know, I love the corporate experience of Sunday morning, but if the corporate experience is all we have, then we're starving ourselves Monday through Saturday. And so one of the best things that we model for our people is this idea that, hey, by the time that we come in on Sunday mornings, Sunday mornings for us is really the celebration of what God has done Monday through Saturday. Sunday morning is is not us coming up for air. Like, I almost didn't survive this week, Pastor. Wow, I'm glad to be here. No, see, you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Your victorious, everlasting life started the day that you put faith in Him. 
Does that mean every week is easy? Certainly not. But what it does mean is that by the time we come in on Sundays, we are ready to go. We're in the right attitude. We're in the right mind. We're in the right spirit. We're in the right character. We're in the right emotional state. Why? Because Monday through Saturday has just been an exercise of God's goodness in our lives. Sunday is not the only time I'm encountering God. Sunday is the time that I'm encountering God in the context of other people. It's a corporate setting. But here's what I found. It's easy to worship when everybody else is worshiping. And I believe in corporate worship. Corporate worship is super, super, super important. But passion in corporate worship is fueled by passion in individual worship. Hey, when nobody else is around, when nobody else is looking when it's just me and the Lord, when there's nothing on the line, when no eyes are on me, is my heart still stirred by the things of God? How big is the church in my own heart that I'm managing, that I'm leading? I think it's a great question that, honestly, we should probably wrestle with for the rest of our lives. How, how big is... I know the maximum occupancy of this building. What's the occupancy of my heart? How big is the church in my heart? When's the last time I really stirred myself up? in the context of me just being with the Lord. No lights, no noises, no band, no preaching, nothing. Just me and Him. When is the last time that I have stirred this thing up? This is the last letter Paul will ever write. He never is able to visit Timothy again. The next time they'll meet is in heaven. Paul will see Timothy and go, how'd you get here? <laughs> Same way you got here, Paul. It killed me. <laughs> Church history says that Timothy, uh, that there was a large crowd that was going to worship the goddess Aphrodite. And Timothy was street preaching in Ephesus. And the crowds killed him. So Timothy's just this bold, courageous, you know, but you know what Timothy was prior to being the bold, courageous pastor of Ephesus? He was just an uncircumcised half Jew living with his mom. <laughs> and Paul finds him in one of the middle of his missionary journeys and says, you're coming with me. And the first thing Paul does is take him to get circumcised. This dude's an adult. And he says, why? Because your developmental journey always starts with a cut. It always starts with submitting to the cutting away of the flesh in order for the spirit to grow and to be healthy. So Paul has the spiritual authority to write Timothy these instructions. Can you imagine how many times Timothy would go back and read this letter once he finds out Paul's been executed? Man, these are the last words. It was like, man, that last voicemail from my dad or my mom before they passed away. I still kept it because I listened to it all the time. This is the last letter that, Paul, that Timothy will go back and meditate on. And here's the final instructions for Timothy. I'm not going to be there. I'm not coming. I'm going to be in heaven waiting for you. And you're going to steward this thing and it's going to grow bigger and better than you could ever imagine. And I'm so proud of you. But here's the secret, Timothy. Stir yourself up. I'm convinced it's inside of you. Now stir yourself up. It's one of the tools that I've had to use even with our team as we've continued to grow. It seems like crisis always hits between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m., you know? <laughs> Most of the time on Saturday nights, you know? <laughs> Trying to get ready, get a good night's sleep, preach. You know, we got five services Sunday morning, and it's just, it's like a marathon. By the time that we end, it's just like, what, what happened? Where are we? What day is it? And so, you know, sometimes you have these people call and cell phone rings. It's an emergency. I got to talk to the pastor. What's going on? The pastor, I just need you to come pray for me. Go, what happened? Tell me what happened. Fill in the blank, whatever. And uh, I've had to revert back to this scripture often. Hey, I wish I could be there. I got three kids in bed right now. I'm preaching in the morning. You live an hour and a half away. Yeah, I wish I could be there. I'm not coming. But nine months ago, you responded to an altar call. I laid my hands on you, and I am convinced something lives inside of you. Stir yourself up. Well, I just really want you here, and my cat got ran over, and my basement's flooded, and it's just an emergency. I get it. I get it. I get it. <clears throat> but I will wear myself out trying to be the answer to your emergency. but I know there's something inside of you. And when you do that in love to a person, do you know how much it helps them grow in confidence? They're like, oh, I've got this. Oh, I've got this. So like the next time I have a crisis at 11 p.m., I don't have to call the pastor's cell phone. I got this. 
I can pray in the Holy Ghost. I can stir myself up. I can remind myself of my calling and my election. Stir yourself up. And then finally, I'm in here. And then, and, uh, and I'll transition back to you, Pastor Josh. And we do some Q&A if you guys like. Number four is this. I'm just going in here. Delight yourself. Delight yourself. Psalms 37, 4. Watch what David says. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. You know how when people quote scripture, they always only quote like the second half without the condition? <laughs> Like the Lord will give all of these things unto you. Yeah, if you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. The Lord will give you all the desires of your heart. No, he won't. You forgot the condition. Delight yourself in the Lord. Now, here's what I love. That word delight, you know, for us, I think in our context, we like, so what does that mean? Like be happy in church? Okay. No, the word delight in the Hebrew, this is so interesting. The word delight in the Hebrew means delicate. Stay delicate to the Lord. Stay sensitive to the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Hear me. You have to discipline yourself to stay sensitive to the presence of God in a world filled with toxic cynicism. The next time you're bored with God, ask yourself the question, did I move or did He? Because here's my conviction. Most of the people that we gather on Sunday mornings are bored with a God they barely know. Delight yourself in the Lord. Stay delicate. I hope what you see here in this environment never becomes common to you. The baptisms, the salvations, healings, restoration, signs, wonders, miracles, family miracles. Sometimes it's helpful to go visit other places every once in a while. It make you real thankful for where you're at. You ever have that experience, you go on a mission trip, third world place? All of a sudden, you come back, you're thankful for stuff you didn't even realize. <laughs> well, I'm thankful when I turn on the light switch, I don't see cockroaches scurrying. I'm thankful that I have running water all hours of the day. I'm thankful for Wi-Fi that works most of the time. I, I'm, I'm thankful. All of a sudden, you're thankful for stuff. And it's so important, you know, Scripture says, enter into his courts with what? Thanksgiving and praise, which means this. If you enter into his courts without thanksgiving and praise, you are a trespasser on kingdom property. It's so important that you delight yourself. And even for me as a pastor, you know, by the time that we're doing the fifth service, I've heard the songs a lot. <laughs> and my team has heard my sermon a lot. They know exactly when my jokes are coming. They know exactly the illustration. They know because we've done it. So this is a constant challenge for our team. If I could just be honest, it's a constant challenge. Where I have to constantly remind themselves, hey, what we're doing is special. Watch, you don't have to serve this church. You get to serve this church. I don't have to attend on Sunday morning. You get to attend on Sunday morning. In fact, there's a lot of people around the world giving their lives for the privileges that we enjoy without even thinking about it. No, you get to serve this God. You get to sow into this ministry. You get to put in long hours. You get to show up on a Thursday night. No, you get to do these things. Isn't this the great privilege of what it means to follow Jesus? We don't have to. We get to. But that stays from a heart that is sensitive. You know, sometimes we over-professionalize. You know, church is, church is a business in the sense that we have budgets and all those sorts of things. But... At the end of the day, the goal is not to be a professional Christian. The goal is to be an amateur. Because amateurs are thankful for every opportunity they get. You know, sometimes that's why I like watching college football a little better than NFL. NFL, you know, is making goblets of money, doing whatever they want. But in college, they play for the love of the game. It's the difference between a pro and a not yet pro. So for me, I'm not trying to be a professional Christian. I'm trying to be an amateur. I'm trying to keep my heart soft because if I will stay delicate and stay sensitive and stay moved by His presence. So oftentimes I ask my team this. Uh, we do Monday morning debrief. We get together, the whole team, and we say, what went well on Sunday? And they tell me, and then I go, what didn't go well on Sunday? And they tell me, and we develop a game plan on how to fix it. But the most important question I ask on Mondays is, does this still move you? I tell our staff, I say, hey, listen, I can't ever tell you how long you're supposed to work for me, 
But I do know this. The day that this no longer moves you is the day that you owe me your resignation letter. Does this still move you? Because watch, if it doesn't move you, it won't move them. If it doesn't move you, how are we expecting that it will move them? Which means that the folks in this room really are the people who are most responsible for the spiritual climate of what happens here on Sunday mornings. Because when it moves you, it moves them. Sometimes people tell me, well, I'm happy to be at church. I say, you got to tell your face. You got to tell your face. I'm happy. Are you sure you're happy? Are you sure? I you was know, sitting there like this, and just, you know. And, oh, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be here. But see, your, your life is a, is, a, is a testimony that other people are reading. Every action is a teaching moment for somebody else. People are watching, even when you don't think. And if you don't believe me, just go ahead and have kids. And they, they all of a sudden re- repeat things that you didn't think they heard. You go, where'd you learn that word? I heard you say that word last week. I said, oops. Does, this still, does it still move you? Does it still get you? Does it still, does it still choke you up? Does it still, in worship, do you still feel the move of God's Spirit? Do you still feel that like, yo, I could be anywhere, but I'm here, and this is great, and it's, does it still move you? And if it doesn't, then you've got some work to do in your heart to going back to that place of still being in awe and in wonder. See, the purpose of miracles is not for us to understand them. It's for us to leave us even in greater awe, which is mystery. That's why Paul tells the church, he says, I am a steward of the mystery of God. I'm a steward of the mystery. He didn't say I'm an explainer of the mystery. He said, I'm a steward of it. And I want to continually for the rest of my life so discipline my spirit that I stay in awe of who he is. And when God shows up, I'm like, Yo, you didn't have to, but you did. And I'm so grateful you did. Man, that still moves me. It's not just like, oh, yeah, another guy got saved. whoop de doo Okay, another miracle. It's like, wow, the God of the universe is here. Why? Because in the church, watch, in the church, the God who is everywhere decides to be somewhere. So we talk about the omnipresence of God, and that means God is as much with you at the Applebee's as he is at the altar. That's true. But in church, it's where the manifest presence of God is. It's like holding a magnifying glass up to the sun. It doesn't make the sun any more here than it already is, but it takes what's true and it multiplies it in your atmosphere. And when the church of Jesus Christ gathers, we call on his name. It magnifies what is above, and it manifests it below. Let me end with this story. Uh, 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 My wife and I have three kids here. We have two that are in, uh, we have two that are in heaven. And after our first uh, child, uh, my wife and I, we experienced back-to-back what are called ectopic pregnancies. And uh, during those ectopic pregnancies, she had to have surgery both times. She ended up on chemotherapy. And after the second one, the doctors walked in the room and they said, it is going to take a miracle for you guys ever to have children again. And I said, well, I know a guy who does those. And God was gracious to us and he gave us two more miracles. But I'll never forget the Sunday morning I was preaching. It was in our old building. Uh, 126 Cedar Avenue, a little old historical church. It was the first building we bought. We outgrew it, but but we were there. And I was preaching on, on a Sunday morning and probably to a room not much bigger than this. And, you know, in a room like this, anytime somebody leaves, you automatically notice, you know. There wasn't thousands, there was tens, you know. And so uh, as I was preaching, my wife down in the front row. And as I'm preaching, my wife get up and she kind of walk out really quickly I'm like, I didn't think the sermon was that bad, but apparently, you know, maybe she didn't like it or whatever. And so she took off, and it was in kind of the beginning portion of my sermon. I preached for about 35, 40 minutes. And so she left, and I'm getting up there, and I'm preaching on hope and encouragement and joy of the Lord is our strength and, and praying for people and God's doing incredible things. And I'm getting ready to close out my sermon. And, and for those of you who have an iPad or, or uh, have used one of these before, you know that 
when your iPad is connected to the internet, you get notifications on your iPad, right? And so if somebody texts you on your phone, it will also show up on your iPad, email, whatever. And so as I'm preaching, and, and we had found out a few weeks prior that, that we, were, we were expecting again, super excited, just believing. You, you know what I mean? You know when all you have is belief, preach faith, pray faith, this is going to work, it's going to happen this time, we're good. So as I'm preaching, middle of my series, joy of the Lord, presence of God, preaching, encouraging God's people, I get a notification on my iPad, my wife texts me. She said, I'm at the emergency room, we just lost the baby. Right in the middle of my sermon, you know, and... And I'm thinking, how do I clear the notification? I just, you know, all of a sudden all the emotions come rushing in and you're like, no, this is the one. No, this was the one that was going to work. And now it happened again. And what's wrong with me? And what's wrong with you? And what's wrong with us? And does God not like us? And all we're doing is serving God's people. And this is the thanks we get. You know, just all of a sudden you're flooded with all the raw emotions. And I'm just trying to, trying to preach. And I was reminded uh, in that moment of some of the words that I'm sharing with you tonight and the opportunities that we have as believers to minister in both good seasons and, and, and in tough seasons. Can I tell you that some of the best anointing that will ever come out of your life is when you are crushed by life circumstances, but you refuse to give up. And like you being in this room does not exempt you from hardship. It doesn't. If life is not hard now, just wait. And if life is not easy now, just wait. Because we live in an ever recapitulating cycle of rain falling on the just and on the unjust. And there will be things that you experience in this room that are so unfair and so wrong. And there will be times where you're praying for people and everybody else is getting their miracle except you. How many folks are we praying for? Miracle pregnancies and we can't even have one. And in the middle, I'm preaching Sunday morning. We lost the other baby. And, I, and, and it was one of the hardest moments I've ever had in ministry. But you know in those moments where, where you just feel like the walls are closing in, but you sense the nearness of God, just in a sovereign way. You can't explain it, but you just sense like God is here. It's a hard moment, but it's a holy moment. Finish out my sermon, prayed for folks at the altar, left from there to go to the emergency room and uh, as, as they were taking my wife into surgery. And I, the reason why I share that with you tonight is because it's impossible for me as a, as a minister to know the individual stories of, of each person in this room. But if we were to line up and all tell our stories tonight, certainly there are high points and there are low points. There are times where you felt like a spiritual giant and everything in your life was working and it was like, look at me. And there are other times where you're feeling like, am I even doing this right? And I don't, I don't even know up from down anymore. My life feels like I'm in chaos. But if you can take some of these developmental tools and apply them to your life, <clears throat> I believe that it best safeguards you against the ditches that we are drawn to on either side of our spiritual journey. We took our boy to Disneyland yesterday, and uh, Disneyland has lost some of its magic. <laughs> it, it, it's not the same Disney I remember. It was probably probably be our last trip. But um, but you know when you're on the roller coasters and they're going around a sharp turn, you feel like you're going to fall off, and so you instinctively lean in the other direction. And that's what I'm asking you to do tonight in your own spiritual journey. When you feel like the roller coaster is turning sharp and you're drawing towards discouragement, depression, lean in to encouragement. When you start leaning into the direction of being kind of lazy and disconnected in your faith and no longer moved, and I just don't know where the passion is, lean in to stirring yourself up. It's when you don't feel like praying that your prayers are most powerful. It is when you don't feel like worshiping that your worship is most powerful. It is when you don't feel like presenting yourself that presenting yourself, laying it all out before the Lord, it is most powerful. And it is the health of the people in this room that will be the health of the people in our churches next Sunday. So that's my encouragement to you uh, out of Scripture and excited to be with you guys here at this church and excited for tomorrow night as well. And thanks for having me. God bless. You. <laughs>